Okay, so let me set the stage <laughs> for you. I had the singular honor of attending an early private screening of Gandhi with an audience of invited guests from the National Council of Churches. At the end of the three-hour movie, there was hardly, as they say, a dry eye in the house. When the lights came up, I fell into conversation with a young woman who observed reverently that Gandhi's last words were, Oh God, causing, causing me to remark regretfully that the real Gandhi had not spoken in English, but had cried, Hi Rama, Oh Rama. Well, Rama was just Indian for God, she replied, at which I felt compelled to explain that, alas, Rama, collectively with his three half-brothers, represented the seventh reincarnation of Vishnu, the young woman who seemed to have been under the impression that Hinduism was Christianity under another name, sensed somehow that she had fallen on an uncongenial spirit, and the conversation ended. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to read this <laughs> to introduce the yeah. film we will be discussing today, uh, Gandhi, from 1982 directed by Richard Attenborough, starring Ben, ben Kingsley as uh, Gandhi. And uh, that, that quote was from uh, uh, a long essay that was written uh, shortly after the release of that film by one Richard Grenier, which I will uh, return to later in this discussion. <laughs> you know, this, this is on the Vatican film list we mentioned. From the beginning, I've been saying, why did they put Gandhi? Why, oh, why did they put Gandhi on the Vatican film list? It makes no sense. This is not universally considered a one of the all-time cinematic greats you know it feels very much like it was put on here because it's a movie about gandhi yes right not because of its pure cinematic qualities and in right. fact the cinematic qualities of this film are are, are fine it's a well-made film it's it's well directed not particularly remarkably directed right I, I wouldn't say but it's really the subject matter i think that gains its, its place on the vatican film list but understand to understand is not necessarily to forgive uh <laughs> you know uh so so there's many there's many admirable traits that gandhi has but he also is and i'm gonna i'm gonna set the title of this episode in stone now he also is the patron saint of boomers <laughs> uh you know i i one of my old roommates had a book uh big a big library and one of the books in the library i remember picking up was uh a book by Robert Ellsberg, who happens to be the head of Orbis Books, uh, which uh -oh. which uh, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is a known uh, you know publisher of uh, liberation theology, uh, gobbledygook, quite popular book from I think ninety seven or ninety eight called All Saints, and it's kind of like a, a guide through the year of different saints to uh, to meditate on them. So you've got you know Catherine of Siena, you've got. Uh, you know, St. Hildegard of Bingen, you've got uh, St. Francis of Assisi, you've got St. Benedict, you've got Martin Luther, uh, you've got Gandhi, you know, etc. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so I remember picking up this book and seeing Gandhi and I'm like, I don't care how awesome this guy was. He's not a saint. Yeah. He's just not. Right, right. You know, I mean, I hope he is now, but but you know what I'm saying. So, so it's... Uh, it's just very like this is the this is this is like the the framework that I have in my mind yeah. for explaining the fact that a film about Gandhi right. is on the Vatican. Well, film and list. also this is this also is part of what makes the film work it, to the degree that it does is that the film isn't really just about Gandhi. It's also about principles, but right. you have to question sort of to what degree the principles that are reflected are actually those that were so, so it's like you know it's the man for all seasons for gandhi you know in that sense how so like well they're both about you know the classic guy yes. who stands up for his principles right. against all odds and, right you know that and that we talked about that film a man for all seasons and how le the the principles that are articulated in that film and by extension in the play on which the film is based uh may or may not have been precisely the principles as yeah. understood by Thomas More, right. right? So I think the same question holds here, watching yeah. Gandhi, because, you know, just like I said, that this film is not just from the perspective of Gandhi, but it's also pr from the perspective of the British peoples, like reflecting on this period of time and upon this character and understanding themselves somehow, you know, through Gandhi as a proxy, right? I think that there is a kind of danger 
that you might end up projecting your own Western values or notions mm-hmm. onto this historical character um, and in this act of, of understanding yeah. yourself via right. this situation, right? So, yeah. By the way, when I said Martin Luther, I didn't mean Martin Luther King. <laughs> Jr. I meant yeah. Martin Luther, although Martin Luther King Jr. is also included in the All Saints book. And also yeah. not a saint. <laughs> also not a saint. Of course, like, I hope he's included among yeah. the saints, but... Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, projecting value is true, but also there is this tendency in the past, you know, century and a half in the West of idealizing Eastern Yes. Easterners and right. Eastern values. Right. Both idealizing them as against Western values while simultaneously transmogrifying them exactly. into Western our Western image of an ideal Eastern saint. Right, 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 right. right. Uh, and this is a very old story yes. in, in modernity. I wonder what the first instance of this is, like documented. You know, I don't know if there's like any particular figure, but like it's definitely been in vogue for a while. You know, yeah. But it was also something that kind of bothered me about the film, right? Was that when when I when I saw you later that day after after mass and like we were talking about the movie a bit and you mentioned some of these like complicating uh, historical facts about Gandhi um, and inaccuracies in the film, I, I think the first thing I said to you is, "Oh well, that's a relief," <laughs> you know, and and that might seem like a odd thing to say but but i was i was genuinely relieved to find out that this man was not in fact jesus right (laughs) and and that the film kind of uh suspiciously you know leads you to believe that uh, suspiciously suggests that this man is more jesus than jesus you know so Um, we can start heading towards you know some of the issues with this film in terms of accuracy but you know it's yeah it's worth talking about that um you know, the film the film stresses basically for the most part, um, it stresses everything that Westerners would find appealing about Gandhi and leaves everything that they would find unappealing. Yeah. Out, more or less. Yeah. You know, Westerners might not find hunger strikes appealing to do them, but they find it appealing. They find it nice to think about someone else doing it. Yeah. You know, Westerners, maybe they're not so crazy about the part where they re- he and his wife reenact their wedding vows and she says he's his uh, her sovereign lord. Yeah. Which, that was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's like a different culture you know like the word cast is i believe i don't know if it's used once in the film it's if it is it's hardly at all yeah that's a good um, point the, there's very little i mention. think the, i think the word untouchable the world is oh, untouchable like is once, mentioned a but, couple times but it's not really given any yeah. context so like, like you can argue that the india of this film is like not very indian yes you know right it looks like india there's a bunch of people wearing indian clothes yeah. there's like some vaguely poor looking people you know, uh, right. That's a good there's point. There's dudes with funky beards. Yeah. There's very little of real India, Indian culture on a deeper right. level. Sure. In this. Yeah. Especially um, religiously. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's hard to see how that's not a criticism of this film, you know? Yeah. Um, on the other, there, there's another aspect to it, which has been pointed out by some critics, which is that this film focuses almost exclusively as Gandhi on Gandhi as a political leader. Okay. Rather yeah. than as a holy man and on his like interior life. I see. So yeah. that's part of why it's able to to do these things, to leave these right. other things out. Right, right. Um, but it also but but it can't help but falsify both. So um people may not know that Gandhi was actually not completely committed to nonviolence. It was like situational for him and he went back and forth within like short periods of time huh. in his approach on huh. this. Uh, in the Indian context, he was largely pro nonviolence with within India, but uh, you know he he was not uh, you know he was very much considered him a patriotic himself a patriotic subject of the British Empire for many years in World War One. He was trying to form a a, a company to huh. go over and fight. You know. And, wow. Maybe maybe we can start at the beginning. So we get this opening scene where he is in South Africa on a train and uh, he gets kicked off the train because he's Indian. Yeah. So 
he, he's there. He gets kicked off the train. He's all shocked and appalled. Um, and you see him essentially fighting. It's he's he's shown almost to be fighting for just racial equality in general. Right. So and and there's shots of you see scenes of black South Africans sort of reacting and looking and looking inspired or yeah. like you know. Okay, so there's a couple things to be said for this. First of all, Gandhi did not really care about the situation of black South Africans. So so I, I want to read a little bit of commentary. This is from a negative review of the film in The Telegraph written by Patrick French. Uh, so he's – okay. In fact, Gandhi's demand to be allowed to travel first class was accepted by the railway company. He was not kicked off the train. There's debate over what actually happened in this situation okay. because Gandhi seems to have given conflicting accounts of it. But rather than marking the start of a campaign against racial oppression, as legend has it, the episode was the start of a campaign to extend racial segregation in South Africa. Gandhi was adamant that respectable Indians should not be obliged to use the same facilities as the raw ca kafirs, ca kafirs, kafirs, whatever. That's a slur for South African blacks. Uh. Uh, he petitioned the authorities in the port city of Durban, where he practiced law to end the uh, indignity of making Indians use the same entrance to the post office as blacks and counted as a victory when three doors were introduced, one for Europeans, one for Asiatic, Asiatics, and one for natives. Huh. During one of the Kafir Wars in South Africa, Gandhi volunteered to organize a brigade of Indians to put down a Zulu uprising and was decorated for valor under fire. Um, he was, I would like uh, to see that in the movie. Yeah. Sergeant Major <laughs> Gandhi, Grenier says, was awarded Victoria's coveted war medal. He keeps going back and forth in life between sort of pacifism and, and between different attitudes towards the British uh, empire in 1915 he was trying to form a regiment to to go help the empire fight germany and he said in 1950 i discovered that the british empire had certain ideals with with which i have fallen in love shortly after you know all this high praise of the empire he says the british empire today represents satanism and they who love god can afford to have no love for satan um, during the rioting in Calcutta, he gave his approval to men using violence in a moral cause. He was a very contradictory and sure. in inconsistent man. You know, I'm not trying to, to demonize him yeah. uh, in any way. Um, but, but that's not what's articulated in this film. Yeah. And also, you know, the, the, less, a the less attractive aspects of pacifism are not depicted. We see a little bit of it, maybe a little bit of naivete when he's talking about how to fight Hitler yeah. with nonviolence. Right. The the film doesn't really offer us there's no evidence to suggest that the film disagrees with what he espouses in that moment. Yeah. He says, yeah, there's going to be pain and suffering, but is there not already pain and suffering in this war? You know? Yeah. And then it's like, oh yeah. Sure. Oh man, yeah, that's right. So Gandhi um thought that the way the Jews should deal with the Holocaust is to commit collective suicide, that they should offer themselves up to the rifles of the Germans or throw themselves off cliffs into the sea. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and at different points, but the, even there, he went back and forth. He kept going back and forth between advocating nonviolence and armed resistance. He sort yeah. of supported the Polish resistance at a certain point. He wrote, he, uh, one of the things Grenier really attacks him for is just, having an opinion on uh, on everything yeah thinking he was right about everything but he wrote an open letter to the british people advising them to surrender their island to hitler wow and and then he wrote a letter to hitler appealing him to embrace all mankind of every religion <laughs> race and creed um he also uh caused serious problems for british attempts to defend india from japanese invasion during the war uh, he organized nonviolent resistance against the British at different points, which caused serious issues and huh. and uh, even advocated that the best way to fight the Japanese would to be just let them take everything, come into India and take everything, but let them feel unwanted there. <laughs> yeah. But Gandhi late in life did admit that ahimsa, this nonviolence uh, resistance, could be used against a fundamentally moral nation like Britain, right. but that it wouldn't have an effect. That's right. With everybody. That's right. And in fact, we see that it doesn't have, his hunger strike might have had an effect, but nonviolent resistance didn't really come into play when Indians were slaughtering each other. Right. You know, in this movie, we see the British uh, 
we see we see a lot of talk about you know uh india being a uni unified nation um but india never had unity as a nation before the british yeah uh we there's talk about um the the the, the british sort of say they want to stay to protect the rights of religious minorities in india well there's something to that you know yeah sure um and the fact is what happened gandhi kind of like said like well that's our problem right but what in fact happened and this is did, did, you know shown in the movie is that a few million people were killed yeah in hindus uh, i think it was I forget if it was Hindus and Sikhs versus Muslims or Muslims and Sikhs versus Hindu Hindus, but there was mass violence. 15 million people were displaced in the partitioning yeah. of India and Pakistan. Uh, and there were yeah. at least a million or two. Some people say as many as 4 million people killed yeah. um, in fighting and rioting. He wasn't, well, first of all, he wasn't a complete pacifist, but his ideals are very admirable and the way that he carried them out in situations where it was prudent to carry them out. Right. You can't help but admire him. Sure. You can't call him a coward. Right. You can't call him a lily liver. Right. You know, you can't help but admire his courage. You can't yeah. help but admire his stoicism. Right. His willingness and the fact that he was able to convince people right. at various points to stage nonviolent mass resistance, even when being beaten and stuff. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Um, but the fact is that it doesn't it doesn't always work and this movie kind of implies that this ideal is a universal one that can be applied in every right. situation so we talked about sort of the gandhi's ideals i think that just to like just to like point out a couple other areas where they left things out that western audiences would not be able to stomach yeah so they do mention his like vow of chastity yeah and he made without his wife's consent. Right. This was this was one sided. Yeah. There's a big thing in Hinduism about retaining your bindu. That's a big thing in Hinduism. They have this like they really believe that if like your seed goes out of you, ah. then you like lose strength and vitality. Huh. Um, also, Gandhi was at his father's deathbed at a young man, and he it, he was there in the afternoon. And he left to go have sex with his wife, and, and while he was away, his father died, and he was like never able to wow. disassociate sex from guilt. That's so heavy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, so um, Gandhi made this vow of chastity after being married for 24 years and having some kids. At the same time that he made the vow of chastity, he forced his young sons to commit to lifelong chastity as well. And he disowned his older son for wanting to marry. And then he like... Banished, and then he banished the younger son like from his presence when he wanted to give financial support to the older son the older son ended up converting to islam and like having problems with women and then becoming an alcoholic and dying in his like 40s or something yeah see man and that's then Gandhi wrote a little thing about like how your children disappoint you sometimes yeah well and then <laughs> that's but that's just like ain't that just how it is like i i have so little trust or esteem for any like so-called father of a nation if he couldn't keep it together with his own family you know what i mean so the other things that would probably particularly upset uh even a director trying to film this would be gandhi's uh obsession with uh bowel movements gandhi was obsessed with like the health of people's bowel movements he would inquire after people's he would give all of these like uh enemas to all the people who uh lived in his ashram including like the young girls and like he would have them administer an enema to him uh and he uh he would also uh in 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 preparation to steal his his resolve for his confrontation with jenna over some issue he uh slept nude with a bunch of teenage girls in his a ashram to like to like test his uh his moral resolve yeah. of chastity uh so yeah like this was a weird guy yeah like right. not judging but like but a little bit judging but, but a little this bit. is a weird guy and the point is not so much that we have to reject gandhi and not admire him in any way as that like this movie just totally like westernizes him yes in, yes. in many ways right and and you know and that's probably why it's on the Vatican film list, right? Because 
probably that's the Gandhi we want to remember. We want this kind of Western ideal of the syncretistic, pacifist, New World Order yeah. kind of uh, hero. Um, the closing words of the film. One of the few – Gandhi says a lot of cool stuff in this movie. I don't like the line where he talks about tyrants throughout history always losing because it's not true. Yeah. It's not yeah. true. Yeah. Usually one tyrant is replaced with another. Right. That's the norm historically. I do yeah. believe we get a happy ending eventually. Right. You know. But it comes with the do. end of the world. Yeah. You know. It so, comes with apocalypse. So this kind of like happy clappy like good and love always wins, you know, throughout history – um, crap. that's true. in like, there, there's like certain like limited areas in where that, in which that's true maybe, but like in terms of, in terms of, t no, like, and, and look, here's one of the big thing, the big things that Richard Grenier points out in his essay, which is that like, what happened after Gandhi, like the Indian, like one notable thing about the, the relationship of the Indian nation with Gandhi is that they did not listen to him in any respect. They didn't practice nobody the Indian nation didn't adopt nonviolence. Yeah. They didn't adopt any form of whatever limited form of egalitarianism. Right. You know, right. like <laughs> the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there's there's no respect in which India right. like adopted nonviolence as an ideal. Right. So, you know, even in that respect, Gandhi was just like he did achieve Indian uh, by by general consensus. He helped to achieve Indian independence, but like, right? What else? What came after him? Just yeah. like a regular nation, not necessarily a worse nation than any other, but not a better nation either. Right, right. So, right. so like the the words really ring hollow. Yeah. When you think about, and I was about reading that. even like in the wake of his death, how he was his life and image was really just used by the new government to kind of yeah. shore up their power and to silence I don't political th opposition. I don't think there's any reason to believe that the Indian government, since it gained its independence, is better than the British Empire. Sure. Is more moral than the British Empire. It might be better that it's an Indian government. That is a good thing. Yeah. But I'm just talking about its moral status. I'm, I'm not questioning the legitimacy, the the admirable ideal of independence and right. home rule. That's all great stuff. Right. But I'm just the, – the deeper moral thing that Gandhi – said he was so concerned about. Right. You know, you don't see that really bearing much fruit. Yeah.